subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, the format of the webinar, just to remind everyone, is as follows. We'll have 60 minutes. We request everyone to keep your microphones muted. If you have a question for Kate, please just raise your hand or ask a question in the chat. We'll monitor the chat and also post questions to Kate, or um, we'll sort of like call on you. And if we do so, please unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Um, as you may have noticed, the seminar will be recorded. At the top of the hour, we will finish the official part of the seminar, at which point we'll stop recording. Um, and then you're all welcome to stay on for a few minutes and chat informally with Kate about um, her paper. Yeah, and so that's all I wanted to share. Once again, Kate, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The screen is yours. All right, <laughs> the screen, I like that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be with all of you uh, virtually. So this paper is uh, Scaling Political Information Campaigns and is joint work with uh, Rachel Glenister. So just to start with some very high level motivation, when you when you look kind of around the world at, at low income countries, um, a lot of them seem to be trapped in this kind of low information, low political accountability equilibrium. So you know many have you know transitioned to democracy relatively recently. So you know maybe their elections are happening regularly and they're relatively free and fair. But voters don't really know very much about how the government works, or they don't have very good information about politician performance or about the candidates that they're choosing among. And when this kind of information is absent, it's hard for this electoral accountability loop to function, right? So it's hard to vote good people in and bad performers out if you don't have the information about which is which. So, the question is like, what kind of big shock could you introduce to the system that would shift you into a, a different equilibrium where voters are informed and politicians feel pressure to perform well? So there's been several studies that kind of outline the promise of providing political information to voters as a, a effective tool, right? So not all studies are positive, but there's good, there's good um, evidence on things like financial audits, on candidate report cards, our own work, we looked at public debates between candidates and, and other tools. So, you know, maybe information could be part of the solution here. But when you look at it, a lot of the studies that we have are based on these very like tightly controlled resource intensive demonstration pilots. And this raises the issue of, you know, even if you find one of these pilots that works, how do you scale from this, this kind of donor funded pilot into a large scale domestically owned political information campaign. And for that transition to happen, you know, a number, th a number of things need to be true, uh, including, you know, candidates have to be willing to supply information to voters. Voters to some extent have to be willing to pay for it, even if it's just sort of travel or access costs. Um, you gotta find, you know, if you take the donors out, you need some sort of financially sustainable dissemination mechanism. And then it has to work at scale in a similar way that it works in, in the tightly controlled pilot. So these are the, the general questions that we're interested in, and we're going to apply them to a, a specific application, which is debates between candidates in Sierra Leone. So let me show you the pilot that, that we did. So the pilot is from 2012, and this is what it looked like. Uh, so this is, it's a, it's a debate between candidates for parliament. So, you know, it's a first past the post system, single member jurisdiction. So you have in general, you know, two or three candidates, there's, there's two main parties. And then the, at this election, there was one kind of minor party. And you can see on this picture on the left, this is a still. So the, the candidates have a debate and the debates are videotaped. Um, so this is the, it, Gentleman in green is, is one of the major party candidates. Red is the other. The, this, this guy with the glasses is the, the civil society moderator of the debates. And then this guy in orange was the minor party candidate for this constituency. So the debates are held. They're very civil. They're covering things like, you know, what's your first priority issue for public spending? Um, and then they're taken to voters. And this is the second picture on a roadshow. So that, that's a truck and he, the worker is putting, you know, the generator and the projector and the sound system into the truck. And then the truck moves around to communities and the debates are played 
in the evening projected on the side of a polling center. So, you know, you could think about a couple hundred people gathering in a relatively rural area and then watching this debate. So this pilot, and I'll give you more details on, on the effects that we saw, but this pilot was very effective at informing voters and it actually changed vote choices towards kind of the higher quality candidates. The candidates themselves responded to the debate by kind of increasing their campaign effort and activity. And then over the longer term, we find that elected members of parliament who had participated in a debate as a candidate were kind of spending money in a much more accountable way. So you could actually track through field audits their expenditures to real projects on the ground as opposed to going into, into the ether. So, so this, is, this is the pilot. So it was very successful in this context. And then the question is, as the next election rolled around, why were there no plans in place to scale this up, right? So to have, have more debates and expose them to more voters. So, so that's the context. And so for this paper, we really wanna ask two questions. So, so the first is, you know, why did this really successful pilot not scale organically? And we wanna unpack that from sort of three different perspectives. So the first is on the supply side. So do candidates have incentives to supply information to voters, right? Do they have incentives to participate in these debates that we know give voters very rich information about them? Then on the demand side, we wanna think about are voters willing to pay for this information? Because that, that road show, that truck, while highly effective was very resource intensive, right? So it's not gonna be feasible to send a truck to every community in Sierra Leone. So voters are gonna to have to travel themselves to you know, more central locations to watch debates if it's really gonna scale nationally. And that raises also the question of, you know, is there a cheaper way to disseminate this information, right? And in general, we want to think about, you know, what is the private sector doing in this context? And could they be incorporated into a much broader dissemination campaign, right? So we're going to focus on radio stations and private sector cinema halls. And I'll tell you more about each in a minute. So that's the first question. And then the second question, you know, if you do scale it up, can you expect to find similar effects as we found in that highly controlled pilot, right? So, you know, Angus Deaton and others have raised this concern that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be basing public policy on pilots because there's many reasons to think that once you scale a pilot up, you're not going to find similar effects, right? And, and if that's true, then we should be really cautious about making policy decisions uh, based on evidence from pilots. So those are the questions and we're going to address them in a nationwide field experiment in the 2018 parliamentary elections in Sierra Leone. So the, the experiment literally covers the entire nation. So all 132 parliamentary constituencies come in, in into play at, at some point in this experiment. So let me give you just the big picture on the research design. And you see, we're, 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 trying to, <laughs> we're trying to attack this question from a number of different angles. So, so there's gonna be a lot going on in the design, but so I'll show you the big picture and then I'll work through just in stages uh, the facets of the design that relate to these specific questions. So we start, so we've got a, um, 132 constituencies. So the first step is we're gonna take 72 of these constituencies. And this is what we're gonna use to try to elicit candidate willingness to supply information. So we're gonna start by contacting candidates in all of these races and asking them basically, are they willing to participate in the debate? And then in this sample, we're also going to look at um, the role, one role of the private sector. So we're gonna be looking at, at radios in this sample. And then for the bigger, or for the second question, just can we, if we scale this up, can we get similar results at scale? We're gonna have 90 constituencies that were randomly assigned half to having the debates and half to controls. And so down here in these, these debate treatment constituencies in the scale up, we're gonna look at voter willingness to pay for information. And we're gonna look at this role of the private sector cinema halls and can they help us kind of amplify the dissemination of this information. So, so that's the overall design. So let's start up here looking at candidate incentives to supply information. Okay, so just to give you some context, um, <laughs> my motivation of this kind of 
you know, low income, low information, low accountability, you know, challenge is, is definitely a fair characterization of Sierra Leone. So voters uh, have very little information about politics. So one part, part is about poverty. So they're very, in general, haven't had access to education. So the average voter has six years of education. And, you know, over a third of registered voters have never been to formal school. So this, you know, kind of intuitively means they also, they, they don't have a lot of information or knowledge about government. So, you know, very few voters can tell you what are the key roles and responsibilities of members of parliament, you know, like passing legislation and representing our interests. So that they're, they're not very clear what they, what their people are meant to be doing and not super clear on, on which candidates and what they stand for. And then in terms of the accountability side, the government just ranks very poorly on all of these kind of standard measures like the World Bank's government effectiveness or UNDP, you know, human development and corruption is endemic. So we, we have this, this kind of scenario where we're sort of stuck in a low information, low accountability equilibrium. So then with, just to give you kind of come back to this pilot, you know, this is one, is one solution to this, these public debates, right? It, it worked really well, you know, in the previous election. So some of the characteristics uh, that I think are important about the pilot was that they were facilitated by a very prominent NGO, a civil society um, group that's very well respected and, and participates in sort of organizing a lot of different accountability interventions around elections. There was a lot of buy-in from the political parties. So the candidates from the two major parties and the minor party, you know, participate in the debates and it sort of had high level blessing from government, including the National Electoral Commission. So there's just a lot of buy-in uh, from all the kind of key players that you need um, for this to, to work. But so the pilot that we did was it, it kind of relatively small scale in the sense that it only, only 14 constituencies were involved in the pilot. So the main identification of the pilot was where the truck went inside these treated constituencies. And so kind of moving from village to village. So there's over 200 villages. So it's, it, you know, it's well powered, but in terms of the scale of impact, it's very few constituencies that are actually participating. And then, you know, that, that <laughs> the truck and the roadshow was super effective, uh, but extremely resource intensive. And again, it's just not feasible to send that truck to every community in Sierra Leone. So in Alfred, can of, I ask a question? Can I ask oh yeah, a question? go ahead. Yeah. about the institutional context. I mean, is Sierra Leone uh, like a, you told us about first past the post, but is it more like a UK style parliamentary democracies? In particular, I'm interested in whether they have primaries or not, because it would seem to me that yeah. an easy proxy to, for whether I vote for A or B is just the party if there's not a lot of information, right? For sure. But, no, if, there right. are prima yeah. but if there are primaries, then, you know, they are naturally more connected to the district and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're you're absolutely right. So the the high level organization is there's two two major ethnic groups and each one is historically affiliated with one of the two major parties and they're kind of regionally separated. So you have one party that's generally in the north and one party in the south. So yes, so a very natural metric of whom to vote for is which party is traditionally associated with your ethnic group. And that has very high predictive power. It's interesting that you asked about primaries because <laughs> in, this, in the lead up to this election, we actually did a different experiment with the parties in, in trying a sort of a US style primary system. So, so that, that's a different paper, but the, in the status quo, there, there is no primaries. So the candidates are selected uh, at various levels by party bosses. So, so you're right. When you come to the general election, you're, you're kind of, the party is, is a natural heuristic to, to use. Um, but some of these parliamentary constituencies are actually competitive and others are kind of deep in the strongholds. Thank you, Jen. Uh, that's a question. Yeah, yeah, so can you just clarify what you mean by effective when you say an intervention is effective? What's our metric? Oh, well, I'll get to that on the next slide. I'll show you the Yeah, result. sure, thank you. That's an important, important detail, yeah. Andres, did you have a question? No, no, sorry. I just wanted to um, hand over the mic to Arda. Oh, oh, great, great, okay. Um, okay, so just coming to Arda's points then. So 
the we have three sets of results from the pilot. So the first is looking at, at voters, right? So voters that were visited by this truck versus voters that were not. And so we can come and we surveyed voters basically in an exit poll right after they voted. And so we have the key metrics. Voters had a huge amount of political information that they gleaned from these debates. So if you ask them things like, you know, can you name all the candidates? Can you tell us where they stand on different policy spectra, right? So what is their first priority for government spending? You know, is it health or is it education? They're much more accurate in actually lining up candidates in, in what they stand for. And then on election day, we have increase in vote shares for candidates that performed best during the debates. And that performance was evaluated by, by independent experts who watched the films of the debates and scored candidate performance. And there's multiple experts per debate. So we have vote share shifting towards higher performers. So that's on the voter side. On the candidate side, we find that they, they start investing more campaign effort and resources in those communities that became informed, like that were visited by this truck. So it's like, there's a big shock on the voter side and is big enough that the candidates responded to it. And then over the longer run, so there's 14 constituencies, but we randomly selected those from a group of 28 comparable constituencies that were kind of relatively, what well, we were aiming for relatively competitive races. And so we randomly assigned which constituencies would participate in the debate at all. So then after the election, we have 28 elected members of parliament, half of whom participated in the debates as a candidate and had about a quarter of their polling centers informed. And so two years later, we track by field audits how much of the government money that each of them gets to their bank account was actually, can you trace down to a development project that exists on the ground, right? So there, there's a lot of leakage of this money and those who had participated in the debates and whose voters were informed you can verify much more money is actually going to development. So, so that's the efficacy. Voters are informed, candidates are responding, and elected MPs are behaving more accountably. So, and it's not just Sierra Leone. So there's been randomized control trials of candidate debates in Uganda and Ghana and Liberia. So it's it's not like a quirky thing that just works in Sierra Leone. It seems to be a relatively interesting and effective way to inform voters across relatively similar contexts. And so this looks like a win, at least for voters and accountability. So then this question is, you know, and there was a lot of chatter at the time from the parties and the electoral commission, like we're gonna make debates mandatory for all candidates, all levels of election, you know, next time. And then you get to the next time and there's no plan in place to actually do that. So the question is kind of where did that break down? Okay, so in terms of the, so, then thinking about, you know, where did this break down? Is it more on the supply side? You know, is it a problem with candidates or is it a problem with voters? So let's start with candidates. So here, these are the 72 constituencies where we wanted to just see, you know, do candidates have incentives to participate in these debates that inform voters? So the setup of this was we called all candidates in these 72 constituencies and said, you know, search for Common Ground, who is the, the prominent NGO that did did the pilot actually secured a bunch of funding to, to scale up this intervention. Are you interested in them coming to your constituency and hosting a debate there, right? So it's pretty easy to you know, get in touch with all the candidates and, and talk to them. Um, and so then we said, okay, if you're interested in this, here's, the, here's a phone number and call them and tell them you know, that you're interested in, in, in participating. So here you've got a pretty steep, <laughs> steep drop off, right? So, so only 26% of candidates actually called back to express their interest in participating in one of these debates, right? So, so right off the bat, we see that they're not strongly incentivized to do this. There's some intuitive heterogeneity in these callback rates. So namely um, those competing in more competitive races. So you can think about the more competitive ones as, as these constituencies where there's kind of a more equal uh, composition of kind of ethnic group A and ethnic group B that are that are affiliated with the parties. There's also there's some there's some groups that are not strongly affiliated where you know you see a lot of voting either way. Uh, Julian, 
And just to clarify, did you <clears throat> did you try any callback or did you try to say like this guy from his constituency is willing? Are you now willing? Because I'm guessing there's a lot of conditional cooperation, right? It's like I don't want to participate, okay. but if this other guy participates, then he has a platform that I want to kind yeah. of jump oh, in. Yeah, Julian, you're, you're, <laughs> you're setting this up for me so beautifully. Uh, yeah. yeah. So so uh, I'll I'll tell you what we did. Um, just the other thing on the heterogeneity, like the the minor parties or emerging parties were were more likely to want to do this than than the major parties. So on Julian's point, to anyone who called back to express interest, we said, okay, fantastic. Now go get some candidates from other parties and agree to a date when you guys are willing to do this and call us back when you've coordinated on a date, right? So <laughs> this is where it drops off even further, right? So we had about 26% of candidates that were interested and then, you know, getting somebody else and calling back. So coordinating across parties now we're down um, to only like nine or 10% of candidates. So if so, some of these are at like candidate levels and then you can think about it at the race level. So going from this step of having at least one candidate interest, interested, we had 54 races where potentially you could have a debate. Once you go down to coordination, you're, you're left with only 24 races, right? So you can think about what went wrong there. Was it coordination like Julian mentioned or was it more persuasion? So the, just as a rough proxy, we divide it in, in two ways. So when you think about those 30 races, most of them were a persuasion failure, right? So you only ever had one candidate who was interested and that candidate was not able to persuade other candidates to join. 20% was coordination failure where you had more than one candidate who was interested and, and they, they couldn't coordinate um, on a date. So I think the the main <laughs> the main takeaway here is this is this has a lot of explanatory power and think about you know why this thing didn't scale up organically is because the candidates themselves um, aren't that interested. But then you know if we think about it, you know the debates happen in, in wealthy countries as well. So what institutions do the wealthier countries have to kind of help address this issue? So when you think about it, like, you know, in the US, the UK, like there's a commission, you know, public commission that like, you know, that negotiates coordination across parties. And then the media, either like private or public, so like, you know, CNN or like public broadcasting system, then disseminates it quite widely. And so how does that compare to, to just this organic scaling? And, and can we find something in the local context of Sierra Leone where, where media is, is much less, um, the media market is much less developed. So can we find a low cost media player in Sierra Leone that might be willing to disseminate it? And then if so, can their kind of dissemination or promise of dissemination corral more candidates into participation? So what we did specifically was we asked radio station managers, we said, we'll give you 200 bucks if you can get at least one candidate to join you in the studio for a live on air debate, right? And then we're just gonna track in those areas how many of these stations actually were able to get candidates to have a debate. So this is trying to do something, you know, like a PBS does in two ways. So we're now delegating coordination to the radio station manager and it induces this competitive threat. So right, if they're guaranteed to go live with at least one candidate, if I know that the other candidate is participating, then I don't wanna miss out on free publicity during the campaign season, right? So it's kind of changed the game in two ways. So let me just show you what happened. So in, in, in these races, we introduced the radio platform. So there's, there's 10 constituencies where we had, where it kind of neatly maps the radio station, or sorry, 20, uh, where we did this. And so once you do that, all of a sudden you, you get a huge uptick. So now 70% of those races had a debate with two or more candidates, right? The numbers are even better if you just look at having even one candidate. So almost all of them got at least one candidate into the studio. And then, then the proportion with two or more candidates is, is 70%, right? And then there's these, we kind of have these nine other constituencies that we track just to see, was this going to happen in, like in, on the radio without us, without this incentive? and zero of those constituencies had a radio debate. So this is kind of an interesting, it's very low cost and it's very effective in terms of, of corralling people into the debates. 
So, so just to kind of excuse me, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. yeah, in this in this context, how independent is the media? And right. So, so these radio stations are are relatively independent. If you think about like print journalism, like there's not a lot of it, and you know like the the parties have their associated papers, which would not be independent at all. But I think in terms of um, kind of what is a good what is a good hope in terms of independent media, I think the radio stations are relatively are relatively good in that regard. There are, I mean, the the parties also have their own radio station programs, but those are the ones that, so there's kind of, there's like five big towers that kind of blast out the whole country, but these are community-based radios, so they're small towers, so they're kind of a limited catchment area, and those tend to be more independent. Yeah, so just to, just to sum up the supply side conversation, it seems clear, so the supply side is a real challenge uh, for scaling, uh, there's this has some this resonates um, with with similar work on debates in in Liberia of in terms of who who does and who doesn't have a good incentives to participate. I think the 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 kind of more optimistic message is that this is super cheap, <laughs> just you know two hundred dollars to a radio station, corralling a large number of candidates into debates. Um, we had some research assistants like listen to the tapes of the debates and, you know, we had given the radio stations the, um, the script that the NGO used, which, you know, the kind of questions to ask if they wanted to guide. And, you know, they seemed civil, they were asking them, you know, policy relevant questions. And so it seemed like it was a pretty, you know, a, a debate that was similar to the videotape debates. Um, so I showed you the results from our previous study about video debates. So there's some promise there. We don't have any direct information on how radio debates compares to video debates. Um, but if you kind of put all these pieces of evidence together, there's sort of suggestive evidence that the private sector here offers a kind of cost-effective way to get candidates in and, and to disseminate this information. Okay, so let me leave the supply side there and let's turn to voters. So, if we're not gonna be able to send this truck to every community in Sierra Leone, we need to understand are voters willing to pay to access this information? And we're gonna think about it uh, largely in terms of are they going to be willing to you know, spend for travel costs or kind of effort or deal costs to access information. And so you know, there, there's evidence, you know, for example, in public health that you know, voter willingness to pay is low. And, and if it is, that's, that's gonna be a challenge for sort of financial sustainability of, of large scale dissemination. So to evaluate this, I'm gonna to go to the constituencies where the debates were scaled up. So we, we had the, you know, um, the films of the debates that were at these public screenings. And inside those areas, we got a local private cinema hall. So think about these cinema halls, um, the relatively informal buildings, but they, they have electricity and a screen and they sell tickets mostly for soccer matches, right? So people will come and you know buy tickets to sit in, in this kind of area and watch soccer matches. And so what we did was we gave the cinema hall owners a DVD of the candidate debates. And we said, you know, we will basically subsidize 80 people to come if you will play this debate. Right, so they had one subsidized screening where we paid for the tickets and then we distributed the tickets to voters. And what we wanna see is, and, and then we distributed the tickets to communities at, at different travel costs radii from this, this, the actual cinema hall. And then we just tracked the redemption rates because we gave the voters vouchers of, of how many voters actually put in, put in the cost to access this subsidized screening. So, so this is what it looks like. So the cinema hall is in the middle. So we distributed 20 tickets to, to households in that community. And then, you know, went to like on a motorbike to a community, you know, further and further away and distributed 20 vouchers in those. So we have the GPS locations of the cinema hall and the communities, and we're just going to track voter redemption rates from, from different distances. So this is what redemption rate looks like. So if you look at the blue, the blue line is kind of tracing this. So you know, this is the proportion of the vouchers that are coming in, right? So, you know, it's pretty high at, you know, for the community where you didn't really have to travel at all. 
and you know, it tapers off pretty fast, but there's this kind of long tail. So here, like for example, at two miles out, I've got like 30% of the vouchers redeemed, right? So people are willing to walk for 45 minutes or you know, pay a bike to take them in um, to come and see this, right? So, and then if you're just kind of accumulating how many voters are exposed, you get to pretty large numbers of voters uh, at pretty low cost. So I think that's encouraging because voters seem very willing to invest kind of moderate amounts of effort uh, to to access these halls, like this is getting all the way out to eight miles. We went there's we went all the way to twelve, but there's no redemption from nine to twelve. So so that was way too far. Um, okay, so this is kind of optimistic, and so building on this, we want to know, okay, could these cinema halls be part of the solution in their own profit models, right? So we've subsidized this, and that was actually not very expensive, but would they have profit incentives to do this themselves? And so this was the second part of, of this exercise. So we actually, we got somebody in the community to just monitor what happened at the cinema hall over the five days after the subsidized screening. So we let, we gave them the disc and asked them to play it once. And then there was no expectation, compensation, anything to play it again. And what we wanna see is now that they have the disc, are they gonna play it again and see if anyone's willing to pay for it? So this is just, uh, and basically the person in the community, we just needed somebody that you know had a phone and had WhatsApp. And we asked them just to take a picture of you know the schedule of programming at the cinema hall every day for the next five days. And if the debates was on the schedule to just go and do a head count of how many people were paying to get in and actually watch the debate. So let me show you what we found. So this first column is the subsidized screening. So you can see, you know, so first of all, all the cinema halls did do the subsidized screening, right? So they did it once. Um, there was on average like 23 of our voters, the subsidized voters, and on average almost, you know, another 40 who came in not subsidized. Right, who saw that this was happening and were interested in doing it. And so now what's interesting though, is on average, these cinema halls played the debate two more times, right? And they charged, you know, this is sort of standard ticket price. So it's about, you know, 24 cents. And kind of over those 2.2 screenings, this is, this is then getting on average another kind of, you know, two, 228 voters exposed, right? So roughly like a hundred people per screening. This is kind of the, you know, about $55 in revenue for the hall. And you see now we're getting up, you know, that's like 9,000 voters were exposed with at essentially zero marginal cost um, to, to, to us. So I think this is interesting because, you know, conditional on filming a debate, you can reach a whole lot of people with, at, at, at very, very low cost. So just to sum up kind of putting these things together, when you think about just subsidizing the screening, that's about, you know, like 83 cents per voter, right? Because we had to pay the cinema hall for more tickets than were actually redeemed. Um, but still, that, that's not very expensive. And then, you know, the for-profit is, is, is super cheap, right? So the voters themselves are paying 24 cents to, to access it. And so I think this is interesting because it suggests that you can, incorporate the private sector in a dissemination mechanism with the caveat that this is unlikely to solve the production challenge because these constituencies are relatively small. So you'd need some pretty big economies of scale to be willing to film the debate in the first place, right? So the debate is, I don't know, maybe about $6,000 um, for start to finish to get the candidates, record them, do some, do some editing and cleaning it up. So you know, at a higher level, like for presidential races, you know, definitely there's economies of scale, um, but it's not clear at this level that you would have that to make it worth the while of the cinema halls themselves to do this. But I think, you know, if you're thinking about what the role of the international community, so maybe subsidizing the production of the debate is, is kind of something that's interesting to do. And then sort of thinking about how can we sort of more organically get the dissemination out, right? And so the, these cinema halls 
seem like, you know, uh, an interesting partner in, in that regard. And so I just think, you know, the very large number of voters with the super low marginal cost makes this a, a promising sort of cost effective way to, to disseminate that scale. Okay. So um, if there if there are any questions on this, we can we can pause or I can go to the, the sort of second big question of, you know, are we going to see similar results at scale as we did in the pilot? Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so question two is then thinking about, okay, so so now we are scaling this up. You know, what are some reasons to doubt that we're going to get similar effects at scale. So this is a really nice um, summary paper by Benergy et al. And they kind of outline these six different areas where you could get you know, different results once you scale something up. So you could have general equilibrium effects, you could have spillovers, political reaction, context dependence, site selection bias, or piloting bias. So we're gonna be in our scale up, we designed it to address some of the general equilibrium effects and spillovers. I already talked a lot about the political reaction. So when we were talking about the candidates, for example, the heterogene heterogeneity and callback rates, like it's clear that politics has a lot, <laughs> a lot to say about whether you can scale this up and people will participate. And then because we're now going at just kind of a random sample of places, we'll be able to see if our pilot results were based on site selection bias because we tried to target relatively competitive constituencies in, in that study. Okay, and then piloting bias, we're just gonna see, can we extend the reach and lower the cost of this um, at scale and can we get similar effects? Okay, so this is the, the part of the design. So now we have 90 constituencies and then we're randomly assigning half of them to have the debate and half to control. And then inside each, each of these, we've, we've got randomly selected uh, voter registration Centers, right, so these are these are where voters register and then where they actually vote. So think about it as a polling center. So we've got kind of th these are the treatment ones. So this this first one, well, let me just let me start with the second one actually. So the second one is the headquarter town. So every constituency has one main town that's a headquarter town. So we're going to select those in the treatment and controls. And we're, we're gonna be talking to six randomly selected voters and they're randomly selected just from the official register of voters at that polling station. So we're gonna see, you know, so there's gonna be headquarter towns and then we're randomly selecting three voter registration just kind of from the distribution of these polling centers, right? So we're going between, in terms of the size of the polling center between the 25th and 75th percentile and we're just randomly picking three. So, so those are comparable across treatment and control. In, so in one of those, we're basically going to do what, what we did in 2012 in terms of you know, having, sending the truck to you know, a kind of moderately sized community, having, you know, having the, the, the screening and you know, kind of publicly in the evening. So we're gonna see just, can you do that at a whole, you know, in 45 constituencies, like given the tight, timeline of electoral cycle, right? So it's just kind of a, that the, that's the most direct comparison to 2012. And then these other arms are saying, can you extend the reach at lower cost? So the, the blast screen is in the headquarter town and it's similar, but it's just blasting out to a much larger community, right? So can you just pick a central location and expose more people that way? And then mobilization, we're not showing the screening at all, but we're going to a community giving them the information about where they can access uh, the, the debate and just seeing, can you encourage people to go and access the debate? And then this one is, there, there's no treatment, but we're surveying people on election day and that's just gonna capture, it's gonna say, are there any spillovers? Are there any constituency-wide spillovers um, when, when you scale this up? Okay, so that's, that's the design. So let me just first say, how did sort of this, these 45 debates compare to the 14 debates that were done in the pilot? So first, 44 of them were held. So that's, <laughs> that's good. Um, but you're gonna see like, there's 
a lot lower participation rates by candidates. So these are 2012. So in 2012, almost basically in all candidates participated except one. <laughs> one candidate from a major party didn't participate in one debate. So, you know, of the 14 debates, 93% of them had both of the major party candidates. Um, this, these are the minor parties. So they participated, um, they didn't have candidates in all races, but they also participated at very high levels. So when you come to 2018, these participation rates are dropping off. So this, it was the APC was the, the kind of ruling party at the time. So their participation is dropping from 93% to 64%. The, this is the party, the Sierra People's Party was in opposition at the time. So they had from 100% participation in the pilot down to 80%. So this is an important number. So whereas before 93% of the debates had the two main choices, this is dropping down to about half. So when you're thinking about, you know, what is the information content of the debate, you're, you're, you're getting fewer candidates to participate. The other thing though, was there were different minor parties in this election and they fielded candidates in many more races. So when you come down on average, there's now three, 3.4 candidates per debate compared to 2.4 in the previous one. Um, so you have, you, have, you have more candidates total, but you're less likely to have the two major parties. The second thing that's important in terms of how this differs is that the constituency level intensity is, is much diluted in the scale up. So in that pilot, 25% of polling centers in a given constituency were treated. So that's a giant information shock uh, on the voter side that the candidates were responding to. And this is now going down to 8%, right? So only 8% of, of polling centers are being exposed. So some other, other ways this varies is, so a key thing we wanna do is just, evaluate can you get similar effects at lower and lower cost delivery mechanisms right so the starting from the film screening which is comparable to what we did before the blast screen is cheaper mobilization is cheaper and then the survey is just saying you know do you get anything for free uh, in terms of spillovers there's also uh, there were some subsidies at the individual level in the 2012 study like they were contacted every voter was contacted and given like a cooking cube, I mean, it's worth very little, it's not, it's not expensive, but there was a lot of, sort of recruitment of getting voters to show up and we're not doing any of that. So we're not target, we're not contacting any voters at all until election day, um, where we're just sampling six randomly selected voters from the polling center. So if you put all this together, the scale up is covering more candidates and many more voters, but at much lower intensity. So if just, you know, statistically, this is now an intention to treat design, where we have, you know, much more intense, you know, strong, you know, intentions, but you're going to have a lot less uh, take up. So, that, you know, that just has obvious implications for statistical power. But I think substantively, this is different in terms of common knowledge generation. So you're not having large groups of voters that are all seeing it at the same time and talking about it um, and, you know, knowing that the other voters have seen it and the candidates know that the voters have seen it. And then if you can think about just the accountability pressure in the previous one, the elected politicians know that 25% of essentially their voters have, have seen what they stand for and what they promise to do. And that's going down way lower now, right? So you can, in the real world sense, you could think we might have different effects both on voters and candidates. Um, okay. So let, let's just look at what the actual take up on the voter side is. So if we come down here in the 2012 pilot, basically 82% of voters in the sample in the treatment areas did actually watch the debate, right? And you can think about, you know, they're, this is, they're living in this community, it's the evening, there's not a lot of competing demands on their time. So, you know, most people went. This, so in the most comparable arm of the, of the 2018 experiment, only 26% of voters that we talked to on election day had actually seen the debate, right? So that's a big difference in terms of uh, on the voter side, the sort of saturation of the treatment. In the blast screen, it's, it's a little bit lower, but pretty similar. Um, and in mobilization, just telling people, giving them the information, you got about 6% of voters to go, right? And these are the comparable numbers in control. So these are all, you know, these p-values, these are 
you know, you really did get an increase of 26%, 22%, 6%. Here is now the kind of, this is the spillover, right? So we didn't do anything. This is just checking whether there's constituency level spillovers. And, and the answer is no. So there's really no difference between treated or control. So this kind of one of the questions of the scale up spillovers is, is not going to be relevant in this context. Okay, there's an interesting sort of supply side meets demand side interaction, which is that if you look at voters just kind of were voters exposed. More voters were exposed when the candidate who was kind of most likely to win participated in the debates, right? So we can do this, we can pick who we think is going to win doing basically just leveraging this kind of the, the ethnic compositions being associated with different political parties. So, you know, in party in the APC stronghold, we would say that the most likely candidate would be the APC candidate, right? So, and then we're asking, did the APC candidate actually participate in that debate or not? Because I showed you that there was much lower participation rates on the candidate side. So what you see is like, you know, the voters were significantly more likely to be exposed to the debate when their kind of most preferred candidate was, was part of the debate, at least for the film screen kind of, you know, looks positive uh, for the blast screen. Okay. so. This kind of the 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 piloting bias was that the, the six of the of the the Banerjee at all keepers kind of categories of reasons we would think uh, we we wouldn't have the same result at scale. So that was kind of a problem in this regard. So for example, we sent you know text messages to people to to try to get them to come to the debates, and so that that worked <laughs> that worked really well in the film screening and the blast screening. But where we needed it was in the mobilization arms. And you know, for whatever reason, these were poorly targeted. So we actually didn't get people, didn't get text messages to the arm where we're just trying to corral people, right? So, so that was not great. Worse was our the partner, the NGO partner, was meant to give an audio version of the debates to radio stations for them to then blast. Again, this is like thinking like there's zero marginal cost to doing this, so let's just do it. Or not zero, but very close to zero. And that, that just didn't happen, they didn't do it at all. So you can see there's there's no difference between treatment and control in terms of whether anybody heard this on the radio, which you know makes sense if they were never played on the radio, but is, is irritating from a research perspective. Um, okay, another thing that is interesting is to think about what are the distributional impacts of trying to go to these much cheaper dissemination models, right? So for one thing, going to a headquarter town and just blasting it out, the people that live in headquarter towns are different than people that live in rural areas. So if you just look at the, the exit poll data on voter characteristics, those, those voters in the headquarter towns tend to be richer. This is like a standard, just like household assets score, and they tend to be better educated. So you can think about, okay, if I blast out from the headquarters, you know, maybe I'm reaching more voters, but I'm kind of favoring voters that are sort of advantaged in the, you know, socioeconomic perspective. So you might be concerned about that. And, you know, also mobilization, you're asking voters to incur costs. So maybe that is kind of has some regressive uh, targeting. However, in general, poorer voters are more likely to take up the debates, right? So perhaps because the opportunity cost on their time is lower, um, so it's not clear that that the scale up is having very, very distinct distributional impacts in terms of which types of voters are getting access to this information. Um, okay, so here's the first set of results, just experimental results on whether these debates at scale had similar impacts on voters as they did in the pilot. So the the outcome that we're looking at here is is a is an index of voter responses to questions. So it's like, can you give us the candidates' names? Can you tell us their first priority for government spending? You know, can you tell us which one is more educated? Can you tell us which one is the incumbent? You know, so all of these kind of factual questions um, about whether voters know this information. So in the, the 2012 study, so these are, these are then in standard deviation units. So the treatment effect was 0.28 standard deviation units. So, so that's a really big, effect on voter knowledge in 2012. So we can we can do this by each type of voter registration, kind of the treatment arms. So we see the thing that was most similar to the 2012, we have 
relatively comparable you know, treatment effects, similar for the blast screen, but we don't seem to be getting any effect for, for mobilization. And I already showed you we had no, no effect of spillovers. So if you think about, because this, the ITT and the take up is changing, if you were to scale up these treatment effects, it's actually, the, the effects are larger um, in the scale up than they were here. But in general, the, the, the short answer is for the film screen and the blast screen, this was actually very similar effects were achieved at scale as what was achieved in the pilot. So I think that that is a kind of a cautiously optimistic result. Um, the second big outcome on voters, on the voter side, was whether it was changing their vote choice. So remember in the, in the pilot, we had about a 3.5 percentage point increase in votes for the best performing candidate. So we're gonna do this in the same way as we did. So again, we have experts, independent experts, watching all these debate videos and scoring the quality of responses uh, for all of these candidates. So on average, there's about six experts scoring each debate and we use their scores to pick, to pick which candidate performed the best during the debate. And then we go to the electoral data and see were the vote shares for that candidate any higher in, in areas that were exposed to the debates. So this, uh, this is what we, we had in 2012. So if I look at the official electoral returns, that's the 3.5 percentage point increase you saw there. Looking at, at the electoral returns level data in 2018, I, I'm getting, you know, it's a much smaller point estimate and it's, and it's insignificant. Here I want you just to remember though, that many fewer voters are being exposed at the polling center level in, in 2018, roughly like a quarter of them versus over 80% of them in the previous study. So the second we, thing we can do is we can just ask people in the polling center who they voted for and think about at the individual level, does it look like people are switching towards the debate winner? And here the point estimate is pretty large and positive, but it's very noisy. So I think we need to we need to dig into these results a little bit more, um, but it's it's you know it's it's not clear that you're getting to the level of switching votes um, in the scaled up uh, design. Uh, Julian, just to clarify, how do you deal with the fact that a lot of those the top candidates didn't show up? Like, is there something oh, that like well that, in well a way part, in your that's exact that's part of the problem. <clears throat> yeah, because in your first experiment, you basically the. The winner Everything. was like, it was a bit more cl clear, which yeah. and yeah. now there's a bit more uncertainty about what the other one would have done in a sense. That's exactly right, right? So we can, so you can, you can only win the debate if you showed up. So we're now going to have, you know, third party candidates or the disadvantaged candidate doing the best in the debate because the advantaged candidate wasn't there, right? So it's actually, it's kind of, it's going to be hard. It's a high bar for us to find an effect on the scale. But I think that you're pointing out is absolutely fascinating. It's again, it's this like demand side, supply side interaction, you know, that you're, you're not gonna affect people's votes in particular ways if some, you know, key candidates aren't, aren't there. So that's, that's, a really, that's a really good point. Um, okay, so the vote shares need to dig into this more, but not clear that anything's going on there. So now let's switch to candidates because, and actually Julian, this, this will be interesting on the point you just raised. So in the exit polls, we asked voters for all candidates in the race, you know, did they visit your community? Did they give you anything like giving people, you know, t-shirts or cash or alcohol or food is just kind of very common practice. And we wanna see did candidates, you know, make more personal visits and, you know, invest more in their campaigns in the communities that were exposed to the debate. So again, this was the result on, on that dimension in 2012. So there's this 0.1 standard deviation unit increase in candidate kind of campaign effort and visits. So I wanna look at this in a few different ways for the 2018 study. So the thing that it, the specification that's most kind of an apples to apples comparison between 2018 and 2012 is looking just within treated constituencies and looking only at the candidates who actually participated in the debates, right? So I'm, I'm not asking voters about all four candidates, I'm just gonna ask them about the candidates that I know were in the debate. So if you look at that, we have almost exactly the same point estimate of the impact on campaign activity uh, at the scale up as we did in the pilot. So that's interesting. But 
now I can say, all right, what about just for all candidates in the race, regardless of whether or not they participate in the debate? So that's kind of the point building on Julian's point uh, that he just raised is, is now this is, this is getting smaller, right? So candidates that didn't participate in the debates are not changing their behavior. And then I can go one step further because in 2012, we have this strong result, but we have no way to determine whether that is a net increase in campaign activity or just a zero sum reallocation from control communities to treated communities, right? Which has a kind of different interpretation in terms of you making candidates work harder or you just reallocating their effort, keeping total effort fixed. So in 2018, I can look at just all candidates, all, all VRCs and just look at, so for the 45, so the candidates in the 45 treated races versus all candidates in the 45 control races, do I see that the treated candidates are working harder basically on the campaign trail? And here, there's no evidence that that's true. But again, this is coming back to Julian's point because there's, there's a lot of candidates in those treated arms that aren't participating in the debates, right? So this is kind of a high bar, but it does suggestively, if you kind of send it backwards in time, it, it suggests maybe this is more of a reallocation of effort than a net increase. So this would be the, the one aspect of sort of general equilibrium effects that we can we can test directly in this set. Okay, um, how am I doing on time? Oh, I have only two minutes. So let me skip this. We can talk about this um, this later. And let me let me just uh, uh, wrap up. So I think if it you know the the, the scale up was designed to uh, sort of try to speak to two different questions. So one is just sort of the political economy of organically scaling, you know, a donor funded demonstration pilot to this domestically owned national um, intervention and trying to, you know, unpack why that wasn't happening in this context. And I think we saw, you know, candidates, the supply side is a challenge, but candidates are very responsive to these kind of coordination public platforms. So I think that's encouraging. Voters seem to have very high willingness to pay for information. So voters don't seem to be a constraint in this regard. I think the private sector has an interesting role to play. I think the, the guaranteed radio platforms were very effective and these private cinema halls were very effective in terms of really getting much more bang for your buck in terms of disseminating this information. On the second question about, you know, can you obtain similar results when you're really increasing scale, lowering cost um, with the kind of accompanying lowering of intensity, you know, in terms of, and, and I think the political incentives are, are very clear. It's really shaping candidate response to this, which has kind of interaction effects with how much voters are, are gaining from this. The candidates who did participate behaved very similarly with their campaign effort. Voters seem to learn information um, kind of in a comparable fashion, although it's not clear that that then went all the way to changing their, their vote choices. And then we had these kind of, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we had these sort of engagement sort of accountability meetings after the election. And, and that seemed, if anything, to be the, the debates during the campaign seem to have substituted for both um, for the parliamentary, the elected parliamentarians to actually come back to their communities and for voters to show up to the meetings. Okay, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I guess we yeah. could turn off the recording and then open the floor to additional questions, but yeah, thank you so much.